Hello class, this is part one of a two-part uh, presentation on the, uh, on the presidency. So on this one here, I'm just going to give you just some few introductory ideas. Uh, so just some thoughts about the office of the presidency. In part two, I'll get more technical. But here you see the White House. So let me just advance this a little bit. Uh, and again, part two will be more, um, more technical. Uh, this is really just intended as an introduction. So here we have the, uh, the first president of the United States, George Washington. Just a couple things about him. Uh, George Washington was elected twice, actually, and he's the only president to ever unanimously win uh, every electoral college vote that was available. Now, the, the U.S. Constitution has changed since the um, original one. Uh, some minor changes or some changes uh, related to how the president is elected. We've always had the Electoral College, but the very first ballot that was cast by electors in the beginning, uh, the very first opportunity, every one of them voted for uh, George Washington. Uh, so a couple other things about George Washington, or at least his presidency. He did serve two terms, uh, and he, so he was reelected. Uh, he set the tradition of just remaining in office two times. So originally when the Constitution was written, uh, there were no term limits on presidents. Uh, I'm gonna say more about term limits here in just a moment. But uh, he was getting pretty up, pretty well up in age. And the truth is after that second term, which he served out, he, uh, he, he died relatively short after. But he did set a tradition that was followed really until the, uh, until the 1930s, 1940s uh, of a president just serving two terms, so eight, term, eight, eight years altogether in office. But the, uh, the Constitution was amended in the, in the 1950s to disallow presidents uh, from running for a third term. More about that here in just a moment. Uh, another thing about the president, um, the, if you look at the way the, um, the Constitution is designed and our American government is designed, the way I perceive it is, is um, Congress is really the supposed to reflect the heartbeat of the American people. So all the all the states are represented by two senators and then the uh, members of the House, um, each state is divided up into congressional districts. Uh, so for instance, in Texas, and when this video is made, uh, each one of these congressional districts, there are 38 of them, I have roughly 700, 800,000 people in it. And so uh, how, the, how Congress and the presidency were designed was that uh, Congress represented the heartbeat of the American people. It was considered to be the branches, the branch that was closest to the people because it represented a smaller amount of people. And so people's will, the, the will of the people is reflected really in Congress and Congress will make laws and Congress will make policy based on what they think is the will of the people. And then as far as carrying out, Congress isn't empowered to actually um, do the work of the will of the people. They can only, um, they can only make policy and make law which they think uh, would reflect the will of the people. But the, the executive branch and more specifically the presidency uh, once the will of the people has been determined by Congress, then the president is really designed, or the presidency really is designed to, to carry out that will. But let's move on. Here, of course, you recognize Abraham Lincoln. Let me put a, a little bit of text up here. So Abraham Lincoln uh, was the first Republican president. He was also elected to, a, a, to two terms. Uh, he was the first president to be assassinated in office in 1865. So let me say a few things about, about uh, Mr. Lincoln, President Lincoln. He's probably my favorite president for a lot of different reasons. Um, so one of, the th one of the things that I hear uh, some people saying and, and some students say is that the presidency is only available for people who were born into the upper echelon of, of American society that somehow um, this office only goes to those who are born into a wealthy class. Well, Abraham Lincoln is an example of that just not being true. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was born, I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd call it poverty, but he was certainly lower level. Um, he was, uh, uh, historians tell us that he could barely read when he was 
16, didn't have much of an education. But he was a, a true diamond in the rough, a great, great intellect, and not really tapped yet. But I think he recognized um, that, that ability and his potential inside himself. By the time he's in his 40s, uh, he's one of the most powerful attorneys in the state of Illinois. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so born in Kentucky, moved to, um, moved to Indiana, and eventually moved his way into Illinois as an adult. Um, so <clears throat> a couple things more about Abraham Lincoln. So he, he actually serves as president as, um, you know, in a very tumultuous time of American history. So he's the first Republican Party president. He was elected in 1860. The Republican Party was born in, in uh, 1854. And so six years later, he is the, the first Republican Party president to be elected. I wouldn't call him an abolitionist. Um, there are very, um, and there are varying degrees of what abolitionism is and uh, who is and who is not an abolitionist. But I think it's fair to say that abolitionists wanted as quickly as possible to end slavery. Some of them uh, were willing to, and I, and I would consider this the fringe on the, on the extreme edges, were willing to uh, end, end slavery uh, via some sort of a slave, arming the slaves, that sort of a, a revolt. Uh, but I don't think all abolitionists uh, wanted to end slavery that way through some sort of a, um, a, a violent effort. Um, so I would say that Abraham Lincoln certainly is anti-slave, and I think he's got it uh, in, his, in his sight to end slavery, but he's willing to do it slowly. He's willing to compromise. Uh, he makes a great house divided speech uh, early in his political career that, we, that the U.S. can't, can't stand long term as a country as a divided house on the topic of slavery. Uh, that is, um, we, he didn't think that the nation would survive long if part of the country was slave and part of the country was not. And so he, he really tries to, um, in, in a legal uh, way, he understands as an intelligent man the complexities of the issue of slavery in the United States and how hard that would be to end it so abruptly. And so I think he's willing to to take his time with that. But when Abraham Lincoln is elected in 1860, um, and that would be November of 1860, by the time you get to the end of 1860, uh, two states have already seceded from the Union. And then when you get into 1861, nine more states secede from the Union, and that would include Texas. And so really he's, um, he's forced uh, to face this divided nation. And of course he prosecutes uh, the war He's not about giving up. He's not going to give into the South. Uh, uh, he, he considers the Southern states to be in rebellion. And uh, he considers, at least politically, he's, he considers the Union to be permanent. That is, once you're in as a state, you're there, you're there permanently. There's even a Supreme Court case that says that. I got to say that um, I don't know that I agree with the language of that U.S. Supreme Court case. Nonetheless, uh, the southern states, uh, 11 of them, did secede. So Abraham Lincoln is, uh, is the president during, I would say, the most tumultuous period in American history when we're actually killing each other uh, over, over state sovereignty and state sovereignty specifically related to whether or not a state could or could not have slavery. So he's reelected again in, uh, in 1864, and then he, he assumes his second term in the early part of 1865. The American Civil War ends roughly in April of 1865, and within a couple of weeks, uh, somebody slips into Forrest Theater and shoots Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head, and he's pronounced dead, uh, I guess, early the next morning. And then um, his his vice president uh, assumes office. But um, but this is Abraham Lincoln, and uh, we don't yet have uh, term limits, so he did he was elected twice, but uh, he really didn't get to to serve out his second term, not much at all. And I will say this also, that uh, when he's in office in 1864, 1865, he's actually pushing very hard for the 13th Amendment to, the, to be added to the U.S. Constitution, um, and the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. So there's no question that as you get through the American Civil War, that he's, he and uh, uh, Republicans are pushing for the ending of slavery, and that would be via the 13th Amendment. 
which is ratified, uh, by the way, at the end of 1865, in December of 1865, you do have uh, the 13th Amendment added. But this is something that, that he actually started during his presidency. He just didn't get to see it to fruition because, uh, because somebody shot him. So this is FDR, and FDR is, um, is a Democrat. He also serves uh, during uh, one of the most tumultuous uh, periods in American history, and that would be uh, the Great Depression along with, the, with World War II. So uh, he's the longest serving president. He was elected actually four times. I had mentioned earlier that, Abraham, uh, that uh, George Washington set the tradition of only running for office twice. And actually that was followed by presidents without a mandate in the, in the Constitution. But, um, but FDR, uh, he, he recognizes that it's not in the Constitution. There's really nothing legally banning him from running for a third and even a fourth term. And remember that um, he's also thinking, and a lot of Americans are thinking, that uh, it'd be nice to not interrupt uh, the presidency in the middle of World War II. Um, by, by changing the presidency. So he runs for, again, a third and a fourth term. But, um, but FDR um, dies in office. So he's elected four times, and uh, he does die in office during his, uh, during his fourth term. And Harry Truman, his vice president, assumes the presidency. Not too long after um, uh, World War II ends, and that would be 1945, in the early 1950s, Actually, the U.S. Constitution was amended to forbid a, a person from being elected a third time into the presidency. And I think it's fair to say that Americans reacted to uh, a four-time elected president by saying never again. And so in the 1950s, we have the U.S. Constitution amended to limit presidents to being elected more than twice. Now, one of the reasons I put this in here, because I, um, it's the changing of the guards. You have Barack Obama on the right. You have Donald Trump on the left. Barack Obama is a Democrat. Donald Trump is a Republican. And I, I think it's fair to say that these two men did not like each other. But the reason I put this picture in here, and I, I hope this sinks in, that I, as of right now, as of the making of this video, we have never had any person uh, in office in the presidency ever stay in office longer than the law allowed him to to be. So as much as uh, Democrats and Barack Obama really despised uh, Donald Trump, a Republican, when it was Obama's time to leave and uh, the, the Republican Donald Trump to assume office, that's exactly what happened. Um, we'll be to America when a man or a woman stays in office longer than the law allows them to stay, than the Constitution allows them to stay, where they use the power that they have to remain in office, use the military and weapons to remain in office. Uh, I hope that that day never comes. And so Americans should be thankful that, again, as of the making of this video, no one has stayed in office longer than, than um, the law allowed them to. And I've been studying politics uh, since the, the 1980s, studying it very carefully. And there are always, it seems like, just about the time that a president's term is about to end, uh, so that would be in January following the election year, there always seems to be rumors that, uh, there, that this sitting president is making plans to stay in office. Those have always been nothing but rumors. Um, so I heard that accusation against uh, Barack Obama. I heard that accusation against Donald Reagan, Ronald Reagan. Heard it against George W. Bush, and I've also heard it about Donald Trump. But none of it was was true. It was all a rumor. Let's move along here. Now this is the last slide, and I do want to say uh, a couple things. Not much about uh, the sitting president. So Joe Biden um, is our oldest. Um, sitting president, so 81 years. He'll be a one-termer uh, because you all are aware that he, he, he uh, was originally running and then he stepped down. 
Um, there was a lot of questions about his uh, uh, mental condition. Uh, and there seems to be at least some evidence that um, he, he's struggling uh, with, uh, with memory, short-term memory and long-term memory. That's how it appears to me. Um, sometimes he, he appears to be sharp as a tack, and other times you can see he's struggling to, uh, to put a sentence together. Uh, but um, but he, he's not, he was originally running for a second term, but, um, but he did, and I think under pressure, pressure by Repub uh, Democrat Party uh, leadership for him to step down and his vice president, Kamala Harris, to run. Now, I don't, we're going to have that election here in less than a month. I'm making this video in, uh, in October of, uh, of 2024. Now, all the polls indicate that uh, Kamala Harris is going to be elected, uh, but that's a very, very close uh, polling data uh, that I'm looking at. Uh, the, the data that I see, Donald Trump is behind by a couple of points. That's about it. So it's going to be a close election. And if Kamala Harris is elected, of course, she'll be the first female president of the United States. Okay, that's all I've got, folks. And uh, part two will be in another video on another 